uh, Kundalini is related to your karma, which is, comes over past lives. That's what the Hindu beliefs are, and the, the beliefs of Hindu, Hindu spirituality. And personally, I've never given a lot of attention to past lives, although over the years I've come to believe that they probably happened. I just have never had any recollection of them. And I even have a friend of mine in Toronto that's a past life therapist, and I've never done any therapy with her because I, I figured what I'd be regressing into would just be my imagination. But the night of day eight, after this Kundalini thing came through, I had a dream that I was a Mongol soldier or a Mongol warrior of about a thousand years ago, like a very long time ago. And I was going through a village killing women. I was chasing them down and I was hacking them in their thighs with a machete of some kind and leaving them to die in the snow. And, and the sensation I had that disturbed me when I woke up so much was that I enjoyed it. I enjoyed hacking these women down and leaving them to die in the snow. And when I woke up, it hit me that that had to be a past life dream because I've never dreamt about being back in time a thousand years. And I've never had a dream where I'm massacring women. And I certainly wouldn't see myself enjoying that experience. And, and in fact, if I've had any dreams about killing people in the past, I've dreamt about killing men in certain situations. And any time I have, I've felt very disturbed by the activity. You know, I found it a very disturbing thing. This was very pleasurable and enjoyable. Yeah, I'm killing these women, you know. So I thought, well, this has got to be a past life, you know. Even if the dream didn't have historical value, it gave me insight into probably why I've had so many difficulties with relationships in my life. And I, I think, to be honest, the only good relationship I've ever had is with my wife. And for the most part, the rest of them have been pretty difficult, to tell you the truth. And day nine, I was ready to go home. Um, I felt like everything that had happened was done. And I was bored. And nine days of meditating, and you're not talking, and no jokes. You can't, you know, joke around for nine days. is, is probably harder on me than anything else. And then day 10 came, and I haven't mentioned this until yet, so just to back up. After we had days 1, 2, and 3 where we were focused on our nose, then for days 4, 5, 6, 7, and 8, and 9, we were moving our concentration from like the top of our head, to our face, to the back of our head, to our neck, shoulders, arms, stomach, legs, uh, feet, back, and, and doing a continual flowing scan of our bodies. And this was a type of meditation that I had done before, and so I had good practice with it, so it wasn't anything new for me to learn. But what it did was it helped you be aware of the energy that's in the different parts of your body. And, and their thinking was that if you can't feel the energy in a body part, maybe even an elbow, that that's because you're too physically attached to this body part as being a physical uh, structure. You haven't entered a level of quantum consciousness where you can see your body or feel your body as energy. That's the thinking. So we have been doing this energy-focused meditation and flowing back and forth for five days. And then on day 10, they changed everything completely. And the meditation was on love and compassion. And we sat there and meditated on love. And I thought about the people in my life that were important to me. And I had the most incredible feeling of peace come over my whole body. And you know, until that day, there'd been a lot of trauma and a lot of dreams coming up at night, and past lives and toilet training and all this kind of stuff. And then to finally arrive at a place where you just feel peace and love in every part of your body, it, it made me realize, okay, this is what I was here for. All right? So that was it. That was my Kundalini experience. Um, when I got back, I felt pretty weird for a few weeks. And you know, I'm always used to people thinking, well, I'm a weird guy uh, because I'm, I'm into this sort of thing. But I always think, well, that's just because you don't know what you're, it's because you're lost, you know. But in this situation, I really felt like, wow, I'm, I'm a strange individual because this, this doesn't happen to people. I've never met anybody personally that this happened to. The sensation for a couple of weeks was that you know, it's like my wall, my world didn't have any ceiling or floor or walls. I, I just felt so much more open than I, than I did before. And I think I, I still carry that feeling with me, but uh, for anyone out there that thinks, you know, you have an awakening like this and then your life turns around and everything's fantastic and you don't have any more problems, you've reached enlightenment, that kind of thing, 
I'll tell you, I have had a couple of difficult months, you know, like January and February after this experience were pretty tough. Um, tough with bipolar disorder stuff, tough on a personal level, and then worst of all was I got this eye infection and I couldn't even see a computer for, you know, two or three weeks and I'm still battling this eye infection I've got. Uh, you know, and that's been going on for two months and I've lost a little bit of my vision. So, you know, the challenges were really right in front of me, like right away when I got back. Um, and just to give you an idea, you know, one of the first emails I got when I came back, this woman wrote me and she told me in her first email that she respected me more than she respected the Dalai Lama because I'm trying to heal mental illness, taking on the issue of mental illness. And you know, that's got to make you feel good. But then a few hours later, um, she wrote me and in the second email she called me a cunt. And the reason was that when she sent the first email, she got a vacation notice because I wrote that I had been I was away on vacation. And so she wrote me back the second email saying, remember your responsibilities. And then wrote me this story and I talked to her about it later and she told me that she was joking. You know, and, and that she was sort of saying, wow, what if she had been a person in serious, serious trouble? But, you know, I got called a cunt still. She was joking around, but cunt's cunt. And, you know, to have that experience of being referred to as, you know, someone uh, on a par above the Dalai Lama and then being called a cunt and by the same woman on the same day, you know, it, I think it lends itself to the kind of challenges that you put in front of you when you go on a spiritual path. Most people, I think, and myself included, I, I kind of thought that, you know, as you grow as a person, then your problems go away, you know, and oh, well, you can just bask in loving kindness and everything's wonderful. But more what I see is that it's, it's more like when you move from high school to university. It's like, congratulations, you graduated high school, and now here's a whole lot of other work that's a lot more difficult, you know. So, yeah, you lose, you get away from your problems, but then you get a whole bunch of more problems, but the problems are more advanced, more interesting, but they can still keep you up at night, you know? So that's about it. Uh, I'm gonna follow this video up with one on the meditation technique I learned and specifically modifying it for bipolar people at home that wanna get introduced to meditation without all the pressure that usually goes along with learning meditation when you go to a Buddhist school or, or something like that. Okay, that's it, bye-bye.